Good morning, church. Good morning. Great to see you today. My name is Caleb Hong. Thank you so much for joining us here at Faith United Methodist Church. We are joined not by myself, but also with Steve Velton, who is serving as our wonderful lay worship leader for this weekend. As we begin our service, let's say our mission statement, which many of you know by heart, but in case you need to cheat, it is on the screen. So here we go. Faith United Methodist Church is a church family dedicated to bringing people to Jesus Christ through worship, education, mission, and fellowship. So today we continue in week two of our sermon series called Soul Reset. And these are messages about rebooting and reclaiming our lives. If you're here today and your life feels maybe unbalanced or maybe disoriented, or maybe you feel o overburdened, overwhelmed, uh, you're in the right place. Uh, maybe today is the time for you to reboot and reorient and restore your life. Today's reading comes from Psalm 42, verses 3 through 11. My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, and all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Must, why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony, as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? My soul, why are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Did you feel that? Something just happened that many of us take for granted. Another year is officially in the past. A chapter is closed. And now we look ahead to a new year. The mistakes, missteps, and missed opportunities of the past give way to hope, excitement, and joy for the new life God gives us. Pursuing Christ with each new dawn. Through his grace, we get the chance to reset the clock, to forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. As we work, play, rest, and worship, we know his mercies are new every morning. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, arriving at next year's end through his faithfulness. So whatever we do this year, let's give it to God seeking his will, trusting his plan, and taking this opportunity to restart. Let's pray together. Lord, you are so faithful to us, and you meet us right where we are, no matter where we are. You love us, and you invite us to draw near to you. So would you open our eyes to see Open our ears to hear and soften our hearts to receive the gift of your word for us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are in week two of our six-week sermon series called Soul Reset. It's based on the book by Junius Dotson. And Junius Dotson, uh, he starts chapter two describing his uh, unexpected experience with depression. 
at a time in his life when everything appeared to be going smoothly and well. So his new church plant, Genesis United Methodist Church in California, was thriving. His reputation was shining. People were more and more coming to faith. But Junius writes, his body, his mind, his spirit, they were wearing thin. So there would be just random moments where just cracks would appear, like when he was driving and he would stop just at a stoplight and he would start crying uncontrollably. He didn't know what was wrong with him. He just knew that things weren't right. So one Monday morning, he finds himself unable to get out of bed, literally unable to get out of bed. Okay, he figured this is Monday, day off, no problem. But then he felt the same on Tuesday and Wednesday, and literally he couldn't get out of the bed. And so he just called the church office, told them that he wouldn't be able to come to work. He told them he needed time to rest, but of course he needed more than just a few days rest. On Thursday, when he felt the exact same way, he was desperate. Junius became desperate. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He just laid in bed, crying uncontrollably, lights out by himself in despair. So he called his wife that Thursday morning after four days of just crying and weeping, and he told her he needed help right away. He was lost. He uh, afraid in despair. Junius writes this, my body physically could not go on anymore. My emotions were spiraling out of control. My spiritual life was drying up. And my therapist, in her wisdom, diagnosed an emotional breakdown. An emotional breakdown. I was clinically depressed. And the d diagnosis, it resonated right away. But as I left her office that day, I did have to wonder, how did I get here? What is depression? Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time today uh, learning about depression. I want to talk about facts, statistics about depression, the causes of depression, the cost of depression, and what the Bible has to say about depression, and then we'll go into some application, starting with this question. What is depression? Depression is more than just feeling sad or melancholy. Depression is a common but serious mood disorder characterized by persistent feelings of sadness, guilt, helplessness, hopelessness, worthlessness. Now, these feelings are natural. Uh, we all have them at some time in our lives to fair varying degrees. But when they are persistent for an extended period of time, especially the two-week mark, right? Two weeks or more, and they impair your ability to do everyday functions, like even getting out of bed or making a meal. This is when we talk about depression as a serious medical illness that needs treatment and intervention. I want to offer very quickly five facts about depression. I got this from a website of the uh, WHO, the World Health Organization. So in 2021, the World Health uh, Organization estimated that depression impacts about 5% of adults globally. That's about 300 million people. Uh, second fact, depression is a leading cause of disability worldwide. Third, more women than men tend to be diagnosed and suffer from depression. Number four, depression can lead to suicide. Suicide is the leading cause of death for people between 10 to 34 years old. And number five, there are effective treatments for depression, whether it's mild or moderate or even more severe, but depression often goes untreated because of the negative social stigmas surrounding mental illness. I want to offer a chart here. This is a chart published by the National Institute of Mental Health. It shows the prevalence of depression um, uh, in America. This is uh, in 2020. And this report finds that 21 million adults, that's 8.4% of the U.S. population, had at least one major depressive episode in 2020. And if you're able to look at this map, the percentage is higher among women than men. Young adults, ages 18 to 25, and biracial adults experienced the highest prevalence of major depressive episodes among adults here. 
Now the next slide is uh, a description also from the National Institute of Mental Health and it shows depression statistics among adolescents. And I want us to notice that these statistics are actually much higher than those of adults. 17% of young people ages 12 to 17 report having a major depressive episode in 2020, at least one. Like older adults, young women were more likely to struggle with depression than young men, almost three times more. And while young adults ages 16 to 17 had the highest rates of depression, even 12 and 13 year olds, let me say that again, even 12 and 13 year olds have higher rates than some of the adults in these studies. Now a side note, if you look at the longer trends of depression, these statistics have been rising, especially over the past 10 years, and it's an alarming trend. As a church, we have to be aware of this growing epidemic that impacts so many of us personally, directly, and indirectly. My guess is majority of us, many of us in this room, have either wrestled with depression, are wrestling with depression, or we know someone close to us who is struggling with depression. Is this true? Right? Yeah. My guess is many of us, right? Me too. Let's go to the question, what are the causes? What is the cause or what are the causes of depression? So medical researchers have not uh, found one single cause for depression. Rather, they point to numerous factors that contribute to depression. So one contributing, contributing factor, it's, it's a larger category, it's just biological factors. It involves an imbalance of neurotransmitters, hormones, and this is why a common form of depression, it's postpartum depression, which many women and mothers experience after giving birth. Another biological factor that's often pointed out, it's a possible genetic link uh, in depression, which appears to run in families passed down from generation to generation. So there's that biological factor. There's also environmental factors associated with depression, and these are connected with variables such as changes in the amount of sunlight each day that we experience, changes in the weather, changes in the seasons. And this is why many of us in weeks like this past week when we haven't seen much sun, yeah, many of us feel a little bit down in the dumps and a little bit blue, right? And then finally, there are circumstantial factors. And the circumstantial factors uh, says that depression is triggered by the traumatic experiences in our lives. For example, if you're laid off of work or struggle to find work, or you're going through a divorce or experiencing family turmoil, or ex you're experiencing chronic pain or disease or dealing with terminal illness, and of course, death and grief. That being said, there is no single, simple cause of depression. Nobody wants to be depressed. Nobody chooses to be depressed. And it is not a sign of personal inadequacy, insufficiency, nor weakness. Next question, what's the cost of depression? So those of you who are more financially oriented, in 2021, May of 2021, the American Psychiatric Association they published a report on the economic impact of depression in America. Um, they, they write that uh, major, uh, major depressive disorders is how they describe it. So uh, economists conclude that depression in America cost $236 billion in 2018. $236 billion in 2018, which is a 35% increase from 2010. That's a eight-year window. And this accounts for medical expenses directly for depression, but it also takes into account the cost to treat illnesses related to depression, lost wages, decreased productivity at work, all of those factors. And while a huge, while there is this huge economic cost, it actually pales in comparison to the human suffering connected with depression. Depression impacts of course, not only those who wrestle with, uh, with the illness, but anyone and everyone who cares for them, for family members, parents, grandparents, siblings, children, friends. In terms of human suffering, the cost of depression is incalculable. Now, I want us to turn to the Bible and just consider what does the Bible have to say about depression? And the answer is a lot. 
So I want us to start with today's scripture, which uh, Steve read for us. And in Psalm 42, it's just this reminder that depression is not a modern day phenomenon. It's something that people have experienced for so many years. So listen again. I'm going to read again Psalm 42, verses 3 through 11. And it's really interesting how you hear these quick fluctuations in mood and and just kind of um, uh, just the turmoil and wrestling of the psalmist. So the psalmist writes, My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all of your waves and breakers, they've swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to my God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, And my God. So again, Junius Dotson in his book, he writes that during the depths of his depression, his soul resonated with the words of the Psalms, in particular Psalm 42. In those days when he was unable to eat or sleep, unable to get out of bed, he writes, he could have written the words, my tears have been my food day and night. In those moments where he wondered what was wrong with him, why he was so depressed, what was happening, he could have written, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Junius writes that he found solace in the fact that King David, who was considered the writer of this psalm, he struggled with depression too. Even David, the greatest king in Israel's history, experienced these seasons where he was mentally and emotionally overwhelmed. Even David, known as the man after God's own heart, he experienced those times when he wrestled with helplessness and hopelessness and worthlessness. But when David was at his most difficult and desperate place, when there were no more tears that he could cry, what we hear in Psalm 42 is he still looked up to God. Instead of just looking down on himself, instead of just looking around at his circumstances and everyone else, David looked vertically up towards God for strength and peace. So even in the midst of his struggles, we hear in Psalm 42, David remembering how he entered into the house of God with excitement and joy. We hear about David remembering how he joined the people of God in dancing and celebrating and praising God. We hear David remembering those times of worship that brought him close to the heart of God over and over again. We hear how David, even in the midst of his struggles, remembered the goodness of God. Junius describes King David's experience in this way. And this is not only in Psalm 42, but other psalms as well. He describes it as spiritual dehydration. Spiritual dehydration David was just disconnected from God. His soul was parched. His spirit was dried up and thirsty. David, even David, desperately needed to be reconnected to the source of living water, the source of life, not just superficially, not just one time a week for one hour, but constantly, deeply. And of course, this is true not only for David or Junius Dotson, This is also true for you and for me. In those seasons when we experience spiritual dehydration, when our souls are thirsty and our spirits are parched, 
What we need most is not more entertainment. It's not more ice cream. It's not more likes on Facebook or Instagram. It's not more religious activities or distractions. When we are spiritually dehydrated, what we need most is to reconnect with Jesus Christ, who is the source of living water. Amen? Amen. That's what we need. I want us to, to move to application. And I want to offer two words of encouragement for the people of faith as we think about faith and depression. Here's the first word. And it's two words, sorry. But the first word is be honest. Be honest. For too many people, including Christians, depression is a silent, isolating struggle. Many people who struggle from depression refuse to seek help or treatment because of the negative social stigma attached to mental illness, to meeting with a therapist or counselor or psychiatrist. Depression can be seen as a sign of weakness, as a source of shame or embarrassment. And among Christians, depression is a silent issue because it can also be seen as a lack of faith. There's a writer named Brenda Poinsett who put it this way. When I mentioned that I was wrestling with depression, I had Christians ask me, were you a Christian at that time? Or were you walking with the Lord? Or were you praying and reading the Bible at that time? And when I answered yes to all of their questions, I could almost see the silent questions that then followed. Is it possible for a Christian to wrestle with depression? Many of us, I think, might have the same kind of concerns or feelings in the back of our minds. After all, the Bible declares that we're new creatures. We are freed from sin. We're supposed to be joyful and hopeful 24-7, not struggling with depression, right? I think it's helpful to note that Christian faith actually teaches us otherwise. While some may perceive sadness and depression as the opposite of faith, the Bible would teach us that it is appropriate to voice our pain to God, to cry out to God, and this is the witness of our biblical ancestors. So for example, today's scripture, it came from Psalm 42, but it easily could have come from another dozen other psalms where the writers are crying out to God for help. It could have been Psalm 22. Psalm 22 opens with the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It could have been Psalm 13, which opens with the words, Oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Will you forget me forever? It could have been uh, stories of biblical figures. Because it wasn't only David who wrestled with depression. It could have been Moses. Moses is considered the greatest prophet in Israel's history. But after he led the Hebrews out of Egypt, he was so overwhelmed by the pressures of constant leadership that he cried out for God to end his life. Numbers chapter 11. It could have been Elijah who confronted King Ahab and 450 prophets of Baal. But even after this great monumental victory, Elijah became so sad and discouraged that he cried out for God to end his life. 1 Kings 19. It could have been Hagar, Job, Jonah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. The Bible is not afraid to share the struggles of faithful people who not only love God, but also wrestled with depression. Three quick truths, three biblical truths about depression, mental illness, and faith. The first is this. Depression is not an indicator of a deficiency or inadequacy in faith. It's not. Second, depression does not disqualify us from being used by God for God's holy purposes. Think of David. Think of Moses. Think of Elijah. Number three, God loves us right where we are, just as we are even in the midst of our struggles. So depression does not have to be a silent struggle. And as people of faith, I would encourage us to push back against the social stigmas around mental illness. Can we be honest with each other? Can we be honest with ourselves and be honest with God? The second word I would have for us today is this. It also has two words, sorry. 
I couldn't think of one word, but the, the second phrase is be kind. This is a word especially for the church. Because when it comes to caring for individuals and families who are suffering from depression, we are called to be kind, to care for one another, to bear one another burdens. A couple of years ago, I saw a marquee in the front of a Baptist church, and it had these words. It said, be kinder than necessary. Not just kind, be kinder than necessary. Because everyone you meet is fighting some kind of battle. Many of us, we come to church oblivious to the needs of others around us. We come to church with blinders on. We're prepared to sing our songs, hear that sermon, and get out and do our, you know, whatever we got to do. And what we forget is that the church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. We forget to notice the people around us. We neglect to see the pain and struggles of the people right around us. So I encourage us to pay attention. Take off our blinders when we come to the church. Be aware of the people you see who are sitting next to you, who are sitting around you, and be aware of the invitation of the Holy Spirit to care for one another, to bear one another's burdens. Quick story. I heard uh, the story of a little boy who came home after school and told his mom about his best friend, Billy. And Billy had been away and missing school for several days. Well, today, Billy came back to school, and this little boy found out why Billy was gone. It's because his grandmother had passed away. And when Billy shared this news with his class, he just put his head down uh, on his desk, and he cried. And this little boy asked her son, and what did you do? And uh, her son responded, I didn't know what to do. So I just put down my head on my desk and I cried too. I cried with him. I think this is the invitation for the church. We're not here to solve everyone else's problems. <laughs> we have enough problems of our own. We're not here to take the place of God, but we are here to serve as the hands and feet of God. To notice the people who are struggling around us, to serve as God's vessels of compassion and mercy. Perhaps we see or hear of folks who are struggling and we write a card or we give a call or we offer a listening ear. Maybe we care for each other in personal and practical ways like cookies. Cookies are always good. You know, when I think about this, there's been times in my life when I'm struggling and I don't share it very often, but I, I'm never, when I'm struggling, I'm never looking for um, comfort in the form of sad emojis. Uh, I know that there are good intentions if I ever share anything online and I get, you know, sad emojis. I know there's good intentions. But what I would take over a thousand sad-faced emojis is a personal call. It's a visit from a friend. It's someone reaching out to me who invites me to a cup of coffee in conversation who puts their arm around me, looks me in the eye and says, it's going to be okay. You'll get through this. Let's do what we can to be kind to one another because we never know the battles others are facing. Before we close uh, this message with this week's Soul Reset practice, I thought we'd watch a quick video. It's a three-minute video. People with anxiety and depression sharing advice for others who are suffering. Enjoy. Oh my God, I might get emotional. Okay, the biggest thing I want to tell you is that it's okay to struggle. For anyone who is out there struggling, know that you're not alone. There's other people going through what you're going through too. Being good to yourself. I think sometimes people don't give themselves permission to honor themselves and be good to themselves. What you feel is real and it matters. Right now, you might be feeling like there is no way out, and you might be feeling like your only way out is to end it all. But by doing that, you're robbing yourself from the opportunity to find happiness and to realize how beautiful this life really is. Give yourself a break. Um, take some time off. 
even if it's just, uh, just for you know, a day on the weekend or something. Be patient with yourself. We all go through hard times and don't let anyone tell you or discourage you from what you're going through. You know, when I went through what I was going through, I had such a difficult time with my parents because they didn't know how to communicate with me about it and I didn't know how to communicate with them about it. The world is so big now. The internet is there. There, there are resources. You just have to know what the right questions are to ask and, and how, figure out how to find the people that are going through the same things as you. Get off the couch. Just like get off the couch. I know it's so easy to sink into it when you're feeling crummy. Force yourself on a walk. Make sure you're moving your body, whatever that looks like. Dance, yoga, hiking, football, anything. Just move your body. Whatever it takes, go get help. We live in a place where you can get help. If it takes five weeks, three weeks, a month, just wait patiently. Don't give up. Don't give up on your life because you will eventually be the person you were before. Trust me on that. I just want you to remember that you can create something from the pain that you're feeling. You can help people. In the midst of all of it, just love yourself. Be patient with yourself. These are things that make you wonderful and unique and uh, develop the personality and develop you into the person you are meant to become and know that you are loved and you're, and you're special and you're wonderful. Every day I'll write down the things that I'm grateful for and when I'm in those dark places, even if I don't believe it, I will just look at that list and say it out loud and remind myself it's going to be okay and you have so much to live for. Be good to yourself, be, forgive yourself, be kind to yourself, you deserve it. It starts with you, and I promise, I promise it'll get better. Find people who care, and if there is no one who does care, stick up for yourself and advocate for yourself, because you're worth it. Things will start to happen, motion will start to happen, and it's never, ever, ever going to be cut and dry, easy, black and white, I'm, I'm anxious, I feel better. Like, it's, it's never going to be that, but at the end of the day, it feels so much better to move forward than to stay stuck. Close, I wanna offer one other suggestion and that's a spiritual discipline. And this is true whether you're wrestling with depression or not, right? Uh, it's, but it, it helps, I think, in the midst of any circumstance of life. And um, two weeks ago, I invited you to, to practice a form of prayer called the examine. How many of you practice the examine at least once? A number of you, good. If you're interested, the directions for the examine are out in the lobby at the Welcome Center. They're still there. What I want to teach you today, remind you of today, is a practice that doesn't really need many instructions because it's very, very simple. It's something you can do anywhere and everywhere. Um, uh, and I would encourage you to do it uh, at least five out of seven days this week. If you think about it, do it all seven days this week. Very, very easy. It's called breath prayer. And breath prayer, it's the short, spontaneous prayer that you can uh, pray in a single breath. You think how many breaths you take and what you do with every breath. All you do is pray in a single breath and then you repeat it throughout the day. This is a practice that originated in the sixth century uh, with uh, desert mothers and fathers who wanted to live out Paul's words in First Thessalonians about how to pray without ceasing. And so they came up with this practice. There's no journal. There's no manual on this. Uh, it's simply meditating on a short phrase. It might be a piece of scripture. It might be a lyric to a favorite hymn or a praise song. And then you just repeat it over and over with each breath as you're walking, as you're working, driving, playing, or if you have just five minutes as you're sitting still. The three steps, choose a breath, uh, choose a phrase, breathe, repeat. Choose a phrase, breathe, repeat. So the first step is just choose a phrase. And a traditional phrase for breath prayers, it's the prayer of the tax collector in Luke chapter 18, verse 13, that says, Lord Christ Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Another approach to breath prayer is to answer two questions. And that's first, what do I need from God? Second, what's my most uh, meaningful way of addressing God? So it might be, 
peace, Abba. Strength, Lord. The second step of a breath prayer is to breathe, which I hope all of you are doing right now. But uh, when you're doing a breath prayer, just be mindful of your breaths. Take your time, breathe intentionally, deliberately, deeply. Remember that your breath comes from God. When you were born, God gave you breath. When you die, that breath will go back to God. So when you have this phrase in mind, you say the first part of the phrase as you inhale, and you say the second part of the phrase as you exhale. So if you're saying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, you inhale, have mercy on me, a sinner. Exhale. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. If you go the other route, you have just two questions you want to answer. You say, peace, Abba. Peace, Abba. Whatever it is. And you can you know, choose whatever phrase, uh, however you want to do this or not. Uh, third step, repeat. Right? It's very simple. Continue this prayer for a set period of time. It might be five to se uh, seven minutes. It might be until an alarm goes off. It might be you know, when you arrive at work. It might be when you have that inner sense of peace or stillness. For me, the start of our service, that five minutes is a good countdown for me right before service. Some quick breath prayers and just to center myself. When you are anxious, when you're afraid, when you are tired, when you are restless, when you're feeling discouraged or feeling despair, this is a very simple method to reorient your mind, to reframe your thinking, and reset your soul. So let's pray. And I want to encourage you just to close your eyes and bow your heads, put your hands on your lap, palms up in a posture of prayer. I'm just going to, for 30 seconds, invite us to practice breath prayers. So be mindful of your breathing. Exhale. Inhale. And I'm going to invite us just to pray using this phrase. The Lord is my shepherd. As you inhale, I shall not want as you exhale. So the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Thank you, God, that you love us and you know us right where we are. Thank you that before a word comes from our tongue, you know it already. Thank you that we don't have to live with superficial mass that might be able to cover up others from seeing us. But that you see right through our mass and you look right into the depths of our soul. There is no pain, no hurt, no confusion, no anxiety. There is nothing that escapes your notice. So we thank you that you see us and you know us and you love us right where we are. We thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of our struggles, you are the one who gives us hope and peace. We thank you, Lord, even in the midst of our pain, you can still use us as your instruments of hope. Lord, I pray for each of us that in the coming days that you would draw us closer to you, that you would give us again that hope and that energy, that rejuvenation, that reclaiming of our souls that can be drained. Help us, Lord, to reorient our eyes towards you to be reconnected to you, the source of living water. We thank you for your word and your Holy Spirit for us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would turn to the people around you and say, God loves you and so do I. Um, here's what I know. No matter who you are, you are going to encounter people in this week, maybe today, who need to hear these words, that God loves you and so do I. So don't be afraid and don't be shy. Go share it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.